the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So when I come back from vacation, generally you all are subjected to one of two things. Either uh, anecdotes from whatever books I have gotten to read uh, while on vacation, or a triptych of my summer vacation. Uh, and my litmus test for a good vacation is usually how many books did I get to read, uh, how many times did I get to go running, and when I'm up in Vermont, uh, how many morning uh, uh, rowing or paddleboard or kayaking uh, uh, trips did I get to go on. Uh, the truth of the matter is that I read zero pages of zero books ever since I got off the airplane. Um, I didn't run once, and I uh, uh, had no early morning uh, uh, boat rides. Uh, uh, we had a wonderful vacation with great people, um, lots of great people. Um, uh, in fact, uh, we had uh, wonderful guests uh, in our tiny little cabin. Um, uh, we had uh, the friends of ours that we stayed with last summer when we went over to England. Uh, they were, we were visiting, and then we had lots of family that wanted to see them, and they came, and then uh, friends that came. and. Um, we didn't really coordinate all of it, so basically uh, our uh, house was, uh, w w was pretty full the whole time. Um, and it's a small little cabin. Uh, we had people sleeping on the front porch, people sleeping on the back porch. Uh, there's one very modest bathroom. Uh, there's no real walls, uh, so you can hear everything. Uh, the only place of sanctuary, which is probably the most exposed place in the entire uh, camp, is the outdoor shower. So I spent a decent amount of time uh, uh, making sure that I was very clean. Um, you know, but it really was wonderful. But I, I had this uh, difficult moment where we'd be gathered around the circle in the chaos of it all. And I'd look over across the field uh, to my parents' house. Uh, and I'd see my parents uh, on the porch. And I knew there was no way that they would uh, cross that field into the chaos of all the people. Uh, and I saw longingly uh, in their eyes that they had hoped for a much different vacation for us, uh, uh, that they had had dreams of us coming into town and, uh, and um, uh, time for Elliot to hit golf balls and to play cards with Laura Lee and maybe even spend time with Anna and me. Uh, but uh, I, I kind of had to do this from across the field uh, because our world, at least as we were hosting, was way too full. Um, and I locked into that image as I read the, uh, the readings for today, because I think there are times where that is an incredible pregnant image of the way God feels. Looking across the field and seeing the fullness of our lives and all the things moving around, uh, waiting for God's time and us just sort of going like this. After they leave, well, maybe before the next group comes, we'll have time. Think of David. When David got started, that ruddy young uh, shepherd, he had such a visceral uh, belief that God was in his life, working uh, in and through him, uh, protecting the sheep. He, uh, he prayed, he sang psalms. Uh, he was so intimately connected with God. And God called him to be king because of it. And then as his power grew, as he had a complicated uh, life uh, uh, full of military uh, st uh, strategy, uh, running a kingdom, building a palace, uh, all of his wives, and, and, uh, and as the, the complexities and riches of his life grew, I imagine God had more and more moments of looking across the field saying, what about me? When's my time? see all of the sort of fumbling of, of David as that happens. And now uh, we finish the chapter on David, and it so beautifully ends. Uh, David slept with his ancestors, and then after him comes King Solomon, uh, and he's a young boy at this time, and he has such wisdom and such beautiful understanding of realizing what an awesome responsibility it is to be king, uh, and asking uh, for the perfect thing. Help me to know and understand my people and to know how to best rule them, and to know what is right and what is wrong. And I never want to second guess God. Uh, lightning would strike me right here. Uh, but God says, that is such a perfect prayer that I'm going to give you all of the treasure and everything you've ever wanted. And what's the first thing that happens? Uh, God finds himself across the field on the porch looking there saying, what about me? What about me? Hold on to that image as we get to today's gospel. John is still putting into context that feeding of the 5,000. 
And what did that moment mean? Uh, and really, what does the Eucharist mean? Uh, and John, unlike the other gospel writers, doesn't have it as a Passover meal uh, right before Jesus is about to die. He understands Jesus himself as the Passover. And so it's much broader than that. And the same John that starts off the gospel with the word became flesh and dwelt among us, now is talking about the fact uh, that that same God emptied himself in his life, uh, in his coming, in his becoming human, uh, and in his death, uh, so that we might be filled with God. And that when we eat that flesh, when we eat that bread, our lives might be transformed, and we might be filled with the God uh, that empties himself so that he can be filled with our experience, what it's like to be human. The God who enters us so that we might enter God. Hold on to that, too. But we start with this image of bread. The Lord's Prayer. Every Sunday, we, and then times in between, we pray the Lord's Prayer, uh, asking for our daily bread. Uh, but most of us, the vast majority of, of us, have never questioned where that meal is going to come from. We have never seen bread uh, as something that's going to keep us alive. We've never uh, showed up at the town center hoping that we got employed for one day's wage so that we might show up with a loaf of bread for our family. Most of us have never experienced that. So when we pray and we have this image uh, of, of Jesus as the bread, we don't realize and connect it as viscerally to our deep and abiding hunger, spiritual and physical hunger, uh, the same way those first listeners would have. They would have understand hunger and bread uh, being the thing that keeps us alive in a way that we don't. Maybe when we think about it, it's a yearning. It's the thing that we need more than anything. It's the thing that is on the other end of our deepest anxieties and fears uh, uh, and, 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 and yearnings deep within us uh, that God meets. Now, a couple of things that happened one day when we were um, in Vermont. Uh, I was on a conference call uh, as a part of the executive committee as we were talking about the bishop's uh, retirement. Uh, and, um, and while I'm on this conference call, I'm, I'm muting it because I'm getting these texts coming in um, uh, from my brother-in-law asking uh, uh, me to, to, to go find my, uh, my sister-in-law so that she can call home. Um, and then I noticed Anna's phone's ringing, and uh, our niece is calling. Her daughter's calling on the other line, and, um, and then, she, then the next message is, hurry up, please. Uh, and then I see all the phones going off in the, in, in the, the, the cabin next to us uh, of all the, the different relatives, and I'm, I'm getting anxious at this point while I'm still on the conference call, and I'm yelling for her to come off the water so that she can call up, and she gets uh, to the cabin, and she's shaking. Uh, she has one uh, uh, daughter who's calling, but the other daughter is, is traveling overseas, and she is convinced in that moment that something catastrophic has happened, uh, and she can hardly even hold the phone. Uh, and she needs more than anything uh, that she could possibly imagine in the next few seconds to find out everything is okay. That's the kind of visceral yearning and needing that God is meeting uh, in that. And when, uh, and when she calls and finds out that it's just the, uh, the, the, the water uh, uh, tank that's, uh, that's exploded, uh, everything that can be fixed... Uh, uh, she uh, 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 all of a sudden uh, feels her prayers are answered. In the same hour, it was a chaotic hour, I finally finished the conference call and everybody's been out playing on the water and I finally get in the paddle board and I start going out and I notice everybody's coming in uh, and as I get around to the point, uh, I can tell something's happened and so I come in and, um, and so one of our uh, guests who were visiting from, uh, from England who's around Laura Lee's age uh, was getting ready to jump off the big rock um, and was, uh, uh, was supposed to jump at the count of five, but on the count of three, started to go and then realized it was five, uh, and then slipped and, and grabbed onto this, uh, uh, basically, this root, um, and was holding on for dear life, knowing that if uh, he let go of the root, he would slide all the way down the rock uh, and into the water, um, and that he couldn't climb back up, and he is holding on uh, while his younger his sister goes and runs to get help. Uh, and in that holding on, in that grasping... Uh, uh, the arm that extends out and pulls him back up uh, uh, to safety uh, is the same thing that Jesus is talking about when he says, I am the bread. 
I am the thing that meets your deepest hunger, your deepest need in that moment. Uh, when you are looking at the phone, uh, 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 hoping the doctor calls to say it's not cancer, or hoping to get the call that everything is going to be okay, that your loved one uh, made it through the night, whatever it might be, that is what God promises on the other end. That is what God is saying when he says, I am the bread. I am your deepest yearning, your deepest longing, your deepest need. Uh, and when we come to the table, it's not magic. But it's God's commitment to be there, to be there in your needs and in the fullness of your life. Uh, and when you empty yourself, that's your part. And you make room for God. He promises to abide in you. Take this bread uh, as part of our sealing our lives together. The word abide uh, from the word mano means to set up residence, to pitch your tent. And God says that. Jesus says, I will pitch my tent in you. In becoming flesh, I've already begun it. I will pitch, pitch my tent in you. I will set up my life in you and you in me. That's part of the whole incarnation. And when you come up, Jesus embeds his life in you and you pledge to make room. To make room for God in your own life so that you may be filled with the joy and the fullness and that end to your deepest yearning, your deepest desires, even before you can name or acknowledge what they truly are. That's what God promises to be. So when you come forward, remember that God has emptied himself so that he can fill you, but that you're pledging to empty yourself so that you can be filled and that you can be present in the divine life. Amen.